Uh, it's great to see everyone here. Matt, that was beautiful. That was beautiful. Hey, we're gl I'm gl glad you're here today, and I uh, love this church. I love the compassion of this church. We're in this series called Journey Towards Compassion, and we're learning uh, what compassion looks like for our neighbor, for those in our community, those around the world, and even those in our own families. And so just thank you. I want to give you some, anyone like good news today? Let me give you some good news. Let me give you some good news. God told Jeremiah this. God told Jeremiah something about Jeremiah that is true about you and I. So I want you to take this very personal this morning, all right? Very personal. God said to Jeremiah, and he says to you and I today, and the key to this is you have to believe it. He says, before I made you in your mother's womb, I chose you. Do you believe that? That God chose you. Before you were born, this blows me away. Before you were born, I set you apart for a special work. When you cross the line of faith and say, I'm going to be a follower of Jesus, and you know we're all doing the best we know how, and we're all on this journey, the, the, the reality is as soon as we do that, God has set us apart for something beyond just ourselves. And there's no greater feeling than the feeling of being used by God to make a difference. Have you ever experienced that? Where you, you've done something and maybe it's just humbly or you've just helped someone, but there's that feeling because God has set us apart to make a difference in our world. Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. And it really is. There's something about when we put our lives out there. It's, it's the key to mental health, uh, experts say. There's nothing that feels better or is more important than helping someone else. But, but I, I, to, to even top that, I think there's nothing better. There's nothing better or more important than helping someone find God. Now that is a cool feeling because you can't take that away. A couple weeks ago, I, I saw an old friend. His name's Tim. And, and uh, Tim, really smart guy. He's a contractor. And, and, uh, just a re but, but he went through a really dark time in his life. He was kind of a self-made man. And he, uh, he started drinking too much. He got into drugs. Uh, he got into these addictions. He lost his job. He ultimately became homeless. And when he became homeless, he was mad at God. He was mad at everyone. And someone invited him through the doors of the church that I was at. And slowly but surely, through the hands and feet of a church that did not judge him, he discovered Christ. And today he has a job, he has shelter, and he is mentoring men who are coming out of prison, helping them not only get work, but mentoring them in their walk with Christ. It's so cool. And, and Tim looked at me was a few weeks ago and he said, Ken, I don't think I would have found Christ without your church. That's what the church is about. That's what this church is about. Wouldn't it be great if just hundreds and hundreds in this Roseville community said, you know, I don't know if I would have known Jesus except for Life Community Church. I want to ask this question today. This will be in your small groups uh, when you meet in your small groups this week. And, and the question is, who helped you find God? Who helped you find God? Think about that. And if you know who helped you, make sure that person knows that you're thankful. Write them a letter. You know, make a phone call if we do that these days. Uh, text them, wh whatever we do. But just let them know. Uh, I grew up in church. I grew up in church, and it was a pretty legalistic church. And and uh, I went off to college, and I was kind of confused about my faith. And I knew I was a Christian, but I also felt like uh, you know, there's a big world out there. And I went to a college that had a lot of different uh, religions involved, and so I was just really I had a crisis of faith. I wanted to believe what I believed for myself, and not because my parents told me to believe it. So uh, I read a book called The Ragamuffin Gospel by Brennan Manning. It changed my life because he introduced me to grace. It wasn't about what I did. It was about what Christ did for me on the cross. It's about grace. It's about a relationship with Jesus. Changed my life. Changed the trajectory of what I ended up doing for my life. And so towards the end of Brennan Manning's life, he was in his 80s. He came and he spoke at our church. And Brennan was about this tall. And he would speak with this French Brooklyn Creole accent because he's from Louisiana. And I just remember walking up to him after he spoke and he gave me a hug and his head was right here. And I just whispered in his ear, Brennan, you're the reason 
I found God. And I will forever be grateful for that. That's what it's about. There's no greater feeling. There's no greater feeling. And, and, and I say all that to say it really is our commitment when you, when you bring it down to, to, to the focus of what is Life Community Church really about. It's about a lot of things. But ultimately, our vision statement is we want to help people find God. In fact, it, it's what the Jesus of our scriptures teaches us. In fact, a theologian, Michael Green, said this. He said, one of the most striking features of the early church days was the, the people who engaged in helping people find God. He says, helping people find God was not the preserve of the very zealous or the officially designated pastors. Sharing God's redemptive plan was the prerogative and the duty and the honor of every Christ follower. And as a student of the church and speaking in many churches, one of the sad things that can happen in a church is churches can get filled with unhappy people because they're not participating in the activities that God made them active to be in. That the people aren't involved in what God has set us apart to show people the goodness and the love and the grace of Jesus. I was talking to a pastor, true story, a few years ago. Pastor, he, he, he probably needed a sabbatical because he said, he said, I don't preach on Easter anymore. I'm like, whoa, Easter, that's where everybody comes. He says, I don't preach, I don't bother. They don't come back the next week anyway. I wanted to say a lot of things at that one, like maybe improve your speaking. I don't know I, is what it was. We have the greatest message in the world. Now, the key is not to muddy it up. Paul said this in 2 Corinthians, this is the message. Through Christ, God has made peace between us and himself and has given us that same calling to tell everyone about the peace that we can have with Jesus. How much does this world desperately need peace? Your neighbor, your coworker, maybe a family member, everyone around you, your relatives, your neighbors, your coworkers, every one of them have a hole in their heart and only God can fill that hole. And some of us in this room, we spent a lot of years trying to fill that hole with other things, and it doesn't work. On the outside, people may say, I'm not interested in Jesus. I'm not into God. But inside, there is a hole. There's a hole in their heart, and it's a universal hunger. And Jesus says this, and this is why there's a lot of joy when we are uh, uh, participating in what we've been set apart to do. The Bible says that there is joy in heaven when one person steps across the line. They have a party in heaven every time one person meets Jesus. So this is what I want to do. This is a simple message. I want to tell you a story from the Bible about four guys, four dudes, okay? They're a small group. I want to talk about this small group. Let me read you one of my favorite stories. Kyle spoke on this a few months ago, and he focused on the work of Jesus. I want to take this story again and then focus on the work of these four guys. Let me read you about how four guys, because of their love, commitment, their faithfulness, compassion, and sacrifice, helped a friend of theirs discover that God meets our physical, our emotional, our relational, and our spiritual needs. Let me read to you about how four friends took being God's representatives seriously and introduced their friend to the forgiving, reuniting power of Jesus Christ. It's found in Mark 2. It's found in Mark 2. I call these four guys, this small group, I call them rope holders, okay? Everybody say rope holders because I want, we're going to talk about what these guys did, set apart to help this, a friend of theirs meet Jesus. So let me just read you the story. Uh, it's a great story. S several days later, uh, Jesus returned to Capernaum and the news of his arrival spread quickly through the city. So you just have to picture this now. Soon the house where he was staying, now imagine Jesus is staying at someone's house. Imagine if this was your house. The house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there wasn't room for a single person more, not even outside the door. And he's preaching the word. So it's just packed on the inside, packed on the outside. And Jesus is preaching the word, which he would do, which was the Old Testament. So I'm sure Jesus, who loved the prophets, was teaching about walk humbly with your God, love mercy, do justice. He's talking about what the prophets were about about redemption, and about justice. So he's preaching this, and it says four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a stretcher. Four guys carrying a guy on a stretcher. He's paralyzed. Now, they had to look up 
and they see there's no room. You can't even see the door. It's so packed. It's full inside. It's full outside. And it says they couldn't get to Jesus through the crowds, so they dug. I love this story. They dug through the clay roof above his head. Now I'm really thinking about the guy that let Jesus stay at his house. They dug through the clay roof above his head and lowered the sick man on his stretcher right down in front of Jesus. And I love this. I love it says when Jesus saw how strongly they believed, the four guys, this small group of men, they believed that if they could get their friend to Jesus, things would change. When he saw how strongly they believed that he would help, Jesus said to the sick man, son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the Jewish religious leaders said to themselves as they sat there, and the Jewish leaders seem to always have the best seats in the house, but they say to one another, what? This is blasphemy. This is blasphemy. Does he think he is God? For only God can forgive sins. Now, they were saying this to one another, but as it says in the scripture, Jesus can read minds. Oh, isn't that a bummer? <laughs> yes, I I'm going to think about this and leave Jesus out of it. Now, Jesus can read minds. So it says, Jesus could read their minds, and he said to them at once, why does this bother you? Now, that must have shocked them. Like, what? What? We weren't saying anything. What? <laughs> he says, why does this bother you that I, the Messiah, have the authority on earth to forgive sins? And I love this, though. Jesus says, yeah, but you're right. Talk is cheap. Anybody could say that. So I'll prove it to you by healing this man. Then turning to the paralyzed man, he commanded, pick up your stretcher, go on home, for you are healed. And the man jumped up, took the stretcher, pushed his way through the stunned onlookers. And I love this. This is the fruit of four guys getting someone to Jesus. The whole crowd began to praise God. We've never seen anything like this before, they exclaimed. I love this picture. I love this picture of four guys getting someone to Jesus. And because of that, God God is praised, and people are blown away. I want to talk today real quickly. I want you to write these things down. This is real practical. I want to talk about four things these rope holders were committed to. These four guys in a small group, they were committed to four things that I think if we live this out as a church and as individuals, I think some powerful things can happen, and the community around us will praise God because they will see God's goodness. Four, four things these rope holders were committed to. The first one was this. They had a gripping vision. That's the first one. They had a gripping vision. God always starts with a vision. Nothing happens without vision. When God wants to work in your life, he always starts by giving you a vision about yourself, about what he wants you to do, about the impact he's going to use your life because he has set you apart. Remember, he has set you apart. So God starts with a vision. There's many examples of this in the Bible. God gave Noah a vision to build an ark. God gave Abraham a vision of being the father of a great nation. God gave Joseph a vision of being a leader who would save his people. God gave Nehemiah a vision of building a wall around Jerusalem. God gave David a dream of building the temple. Nothing happens, and I, 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 nothing serious and effective happens without a vision for our lives. Nothing happens. Jesus came to this earth, and he says, I got to be really clear what my vision, why I'm here, because everybody was trying to tell, define why he was here. So he goes to the synagogue, and he brings out the scrolls. West Stafford talked about this in the movie we saw a few weeks ago, and he opens up Isaiah 61. And Jesus says, this is the vision. This is why I'm here. People will try to redefine why I'm here and, and why I came, but this is it. He says, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus came to set captives free. He came, he came to, to, to not judge. He didn't come to condemn, but he came to save. And these rope holders, these rope holders had a, a gripping vision that this man needed Jesus. They said he's paralyzed. We got to get him to Jesus. Friends, at Life Community Church, my prayer is that we would continue to have a gripping vision that people need Jesus. 
They need his redemption. They, 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 need, they need eternal life. They need his joy and the peace. They need Jesus. And the, the, the challenge here in our culture is the average church in America is less than 90 people now and shrinking. Over 50% of churches in America will not see one person come to Christ this year. Over 50%. Not one baptism. That's why, as Kyle talked about, we're, we're fired up about baptism, not just about numbers, but, be, but because of what that represents. It represents somebody meeting Jesus, and it changes everything. And I believe that people in general believe that it would be a good idea for people to come to Jesus, but too many in the church world do not have this gripping vision. That's why Proverbs says, where there is no vision, people perish. So these guys started. They started with this gripping vision. Imagine churches just with this overriding gripping vision. I got I to gotta get my neighbor. I got to get my relative. I got to get people to Jesus. Shane Claiborne says this. He says, if we lose the young generation of people in the church, he says, this is pretty straightforward. He says, if we lose the, the young generation in, in, in the church, it's not because we didn't entertain them. It's because we didn't dare them to do something radical with the gripping vision to reach people for Jesus Christ. Friends, we do not accidentally help people find God. We have to lean into this. This isn't about guilt. This is about this series of leaning into this compassion. And I love these four guys because they, they had a gripping vision. The second thing they had was this. Write this down. They had a selfless unity. This is where it gets a little comical. They had a selfless unity. Picture these guys. They have got this gripping vision. We got to get this guy to Jesus. He's on the stretcher. They show up, and there's no room in the inn. I mean, it's packed on the outside. It's packed on the inside. And so now there's four guys that have to agree. That's a lot of work, four guys who have to agree on something. <laughs> How do we get this guy to Jesus? Now, I don't know if all four guys agreed it was a good idea to go through the, the, the roof. Maybe one guy said, maybe there's a back door. Maybe there's some windows on the side. Wh whatever it was, they had to finally get to the place where they had to agree to disagree and say, we're going to have some unity here So because our, our vision is so gripping, we got to get this guy to Jesus. And that's why Paul said this in Philippians, make me truly happy. By loving each other and agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, working together with one heart, mind, and purpose. I was speaking at a church in LaGrange, uh, Georgia, which is about an hour south of Atlanta. And I was with a pastor and we're driving through the city. And he says, there's 10 Methodist churches in this city. It's a small city. 10 Methodists. He says, it started with one. And about every three or four years, they split because they don't get along, and now they have 10. And the sad part of that is they now don't have the resources because nobody talks to one another. If you were to combine those 10, they would have the time and the talents and the resources to do a lot of good for their community, but now they're isolated. See, I think the biggest privilege, I think the biggest privilege of being a Christian is not getting our ears tickled or getting our own way. It's being able to serve people and show people the way to eternal life through Christ. And there comes a point where a gripping vision overrides our own way. Now, if you forget everything else today, but you still have to pay attention to the rest of the message, but, but if you could just write this down. Unity is the fruit. Vision is the root. Unity is the fruit. Vision is the root. When the vision is clear, then what comes out of that is unity because it's not about me getting my way it's about the vision unity is the fruit vision is the root a few years ago i did a funeral in the bay area and i was talking to a couple they were they were at the reception they were in their 70s and uh, uh they, they they were just the nicest people i just happened to sit at their table and they began to tell me about a church they went to in foster city and they said, you know, we don't understand the music. There's a lot of young people. There's a lot of young families. People don't dress the way we used to dress very properly back in the day. He says, but, but, but we are in awe of the hundreds of families that are coming to church and finding their faith. And this man's name was Richard. And he said this, he goes, I remember him telling me, I don't understand the music, but there's no other place I would rather be because people's lives are being changed. I feel young again. I remember he said, he goes, I feel young again. I feel hope again. I feel alive again. That's where vision trumps everything else. 
You see, unity has nothing to do with always getting along or always liking everything. It has to do with being a part of a greater compelling vision. I remember at the church that I pastored for 24 years, there was no secret to this except having a really clear vision to reach people for Jesus. Because people would say, people would say, can you have a very happy church? But the reason was, it was because we were staying on task. Because there's nothing greater when you see people finding Christ. Heaven rejoices and our hearts rejoice. It changes everything. The third thing, I only have four today, so I'm all, all the way to three. These guys had, had, they had a gripping vision. They, they had an, a, a, a selfless, selfless unity. And the third one is they had an irrational compassion. They had an irrational compassion. It wasn't very rational. It wasn't very convenient. You know, there's convenient kinds of love and then there's inconvenient kinds of love. You have to have an irrational compassion because this is the truth. When God gives us a vision, it's usually hard and it's usually uh, inconvenient. When God gives you a vision, there will be circumstances and barriers. God gave Moses a vision. Get the people out, get them to the promised land. He led the children of Israel out of Egypt into the desert to the promised land. He had one problem after another, right? There was no water. There was no food. Then God sent manna every day except the Sabbath day. He provided them food, but people began to complain. They wanted meat. So God sent quail, three feet deep of quail. And people started just gouging the, 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 and eating the quail till, till the quail was coming out of people's noses. People died of a quail plague. And the place they buried the people today is still called the graves of of lust. And then the Bible says Moses died. He didn't even get to go into the promised land. Joshua gets to, and you're going, wow, Joshua got the good deal on this one. He leads him into the promised land. You say, well, that's the easy part. He leads him into the promised land, and the next verse says this, what? There were now giants in the land. Even in the promised land, there are problems because the vision God gives us when he, when he gives us the vision, it will be hard because he wants us to grow our faith and he also wants us to grow our character. This man on the mat was an inconvenient love. He was an inconvenient love. I mean, a convenient love is, hey, we're going to bring this guy to Jesus. Wow, the doors opened and the greeters were all nice and they walked us right up to Jesus and it was simple and it was a love, but it was pretty convenient. And then it had, No, this was, wait a minute. These guys had an irrational compassion. Because they had a gripping vision and a selfless unity, they said, whatever it takes to get this guy here. Last week at the lunch uh, after services for Safe Harbor, which is an organization we're, we're working with to surround, wrap our arms around foster families and foster kids to just love them in practical ways. We had over 50 people show up to that lunch from this church. And I love Kathy Hamilton, the, the executive director. She, she, she talked about fostering and about this whole vision that we have. And she just said it right up front. She goes, this is hard. This is hard. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. This is really hard. But then she said a great line. She said, but the rewards outlast the hard times. The rewards outlast the hard times. Jesus came to this earth, and it was a very inconvenient love. It was an irrational compassion. It says, when we were utterly helpless, Romans 5 says, with no way of escape, Christ came at just the right time, and he died for us sinners who had no use for him. Jesus came irrationally because he had this gripping vision. He and his father had this gripping vision that we, he want, they want to spend eternity with us. This is a very important this is, this is very important because it's easy to preach and say, let's go, you know, change lives. Uh, but it's going to take an irrational compassion. It really will. This is important because numbers are very important to God. God does not want one to perish, the Bible says. So, so this needs to be in our hearts. Sometimes there's an attitude in the church world that says our church is not into numbers. We're interested in quality, not quantity. I would say God's interested in both. Because numbers aren't just numbers, they're people. They're our neighbor. They're our cousin. There's someone in our family that has walked away. 99 sheep, Luke 15, Jesus just puts it all out there. He says, listen, there's 100 sheep, 99 are fine, there's one that lost, we're going to go after that one. 
We're going to use our time, resources to go after the one. There's ten coins. Nine are, are okay, but one gets lost. We're going after the one. There's two brothers. One's gone. We're going to pray, and we're going to welcome him back. And when he does, when he comes back, we're going to throw a party for him. So it's an irrational compassion these guys have. Because it would have been easy to get halfway there, look, and say, with, G, with this guy on the mat, oh, that's, that's a little too inconvenient. And they could have said, some other time. Number four. All right, so let's go over the first one. The first one is what? Gripping vision. Number two? Selfless unity. Number three? An irrational compassion. And I love this last one. Uh, number four, they, they, they participated in, this is the word, in a useful sacrifice. A useful sacrifice. Because there are a lot of useless sacrifices in our world. Now stay with me on this. Let's say my wife goes away for the weekend, and I decide, you know, I love her so much, I'm going to sacrifice for her. And while she's gone, I decide I'm not going to watch any sports while she's gone. I'm not going to eat my favorite foods while she's gone. I'm not going to listen to my favorite music when I'm gone. And I'm just miserable sacrificing all this stuff. But it's for her. And she comes back, and she's, I said, honey, I did a lot of sacrificing for you. And she asked me what, and I tell her what, and she says, who cares? <laughs> who cares? That was a useless, those were useless sacrifices. Now, if my wife went away, I could have done some useful sacrifices. I could have cleaned the house, detailed the house, mowed the lawn, did some house projects that have needed to be done for years. Now imagine her coming home and I tell her all of that that I did. She would have said, now those were useful sacrifices. Might even have been some romance involved after that. I don't know. Let's move on. All right. Okay. That was, <laughs> I'll move on. I did anyway. Anyway. Imagine the guys saying this. Imagine the guys saying this. The four guys, the four rope holders. You know, uh, we fasted that you would meet Jesus. We prayed and we sang songs and we actually did a study about how Jesus could help you. Now, there's nothing wrong with any of those things, but uh, that's not what the guy needed. The guy needed to get to Jesus. These guys gave a useful sacrifice. They gave it because of this gripping vision and this, 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 this uh, unity that they, they decided to say, you know, we're going to be selfless on this and with this irrational compassion. They did something that was useful. And you know, you know this, that my favorite chapter in the Bible is Isaiah 58 because... The chapter starts with Israel doing all of these sacrifices that are useless and God's not hearing them. And they're frustrated that God's not hearing them and not blessing them. And they're doing all these religious gyrations and, and, and God just says, I'm not, I, it doesn't matter. And then he says this in Isaiah 58, I love this. The kind of sacrifices I want is that you stop oppressing those who work for you and treat them fairly and give them what they earn. I want you to share your food with the hungry and bring right into your own homes those who are helpless. Do you know the, the Bible never says build a shelter? It says invite them into your own homes. Oh, that's a whole other topic. I'll keep moving on. All right. He, he says, I want you to share your food with the hungry and bring right into your own homes those who are helpless, poor, and destitute. Clothe those who are cold and don't hide. This is the hardest part of this sacrifice. And don't hide from relatives who need your help. God, I was with you till that point. <laughs> but then here's the promise of these useful sacrifices. God was just saying, I don't need you just going through religious gyrations while there's people out there in need and there's people that need forgiving and loving and accepting. So he says, but if you do these things, those are useful sacrifices and God will shed his own glorious light upon you. This is what it looks like to be blessed. He'll heal you. Your godliness will lead you forward. Goodness will be a shield before you, and the glory of the Lord will protect you from behind. Then when you call, the Lord will answer, yes, I am here. He will quickly reply. I love what Bono says. He says, stop asking God to bless what you're doing. Find out what God's doing. It's already blessed. So when you look at Matthew 25 and you see when I was hungry and when I was thirsty, when I was in prison and when I was sick, when I was naked, when, when you get involved in helping people find Jesus, 
That's where Jesus is at. Well, I could go on and on and on, but I'm not going to, and you're grateful for that. But let me close with a few thoughts about helping people find, find God, because that's what we're really set apart. That's why the church exists. That's where the blessings come. There's a story in, in the Bible where Jesus is on the seashore again, and he's preaching to the crowds that gathered around him. And as he's walking up the beach, he sees Levi, who is a tax collector. And tax collectors, they were miserable people, uh, empty traders, no one liked them. And Jesus looked at him and said, come with me, come be my disciple. And Levi just jumped up and followed him. And you know what? Levi thought, if I can find Jesus, others can find Jesus. So he did something very creative. He didn't invite people to the synagogue because he probably hadn't been there in a while. He threw a party at his house. It says that night, Levi invited his fellow tax collectors and many other notorious sinners, ooh, notorious sinners, to be his dinner guests so that they could meet Jesus and his disciples. And again, in all these stories, these religious guys keep showing up. It says, but when some of the religious leaders saw him eating with these men of ill repute, they said to the disciples, how can you stand to eat with such scum? And when Jesus heard this, here it is. He said, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. He says these powerful words, I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. August 9th, 1993. At the USC Medical Center, a disturbed Sophia White walked into the hospital with a gun. And she began pointing and threatening to, sh threatening to shoot. And nurse Joanne Black walked up to Sophia while Sophia had the gun in her hand. And she hugged her. And she hugged her until Sophia started crying and she dropped the gun. Later, the news interviewed her and all Joanne said was, listen, I saw a sick person and I had to take care of her. There is not a person who has been born about whom God does not say, I want that one. I set that one apart. That one is mine. I thought of that one. The exciting part is God has given us the message of this peace, to this gripping vision to introduce people to Jesus. There's a lot of work to do, but the, the, the harvest is ripe. 7% of Californians go to church, friends. 7%. So we just just to go out and be God's light. Will you please just pray about this? Will you be a rope holder? That's why I love Kyle preaches small groups because we can't do it alone. I, don't, I, I tried to picture one guy getting this guy on the mat to Jesus. It wouldn't have worked. It took four. It took four, not even three. You let one, one, one side of that, uh, you know, as they're lowering it down, and that would have been a mess. It takes, takes a village. It takes all of us together. I pray for this church. Will we live with a gri gripping vision, a selfless unity, an irrational compassion, and a useful sacrifice in our own lives? It, it looks different for each of us. How much time do I have left? Is that the right thing? 140? About an hour? Yeah, no, 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 no. No. Okay. I got to share this last story because it's cool. Who helped you find God? You're going to talk about that in your small groups. I got three names. Marge Moon, Claudia Fryer, Lawana Fulton. Those three ladies were my Sunday school teachers. I'll never forget their names. I'll never forget their irrational compassion for me because I was always the one talking and being asked to leave class, but they kept loving me. But I got to tell you a cool thing in less than a minute. Luana Fulton was my fourth grade teacher. And I was a fourth grade, you know, thought I was a pretty cool dude in fourth grade. It was the 70s. I had the big collars and everything. But she said this. She said, she said listen, we're going to do a contest. This is fourth grade Sunday school. In a few weeks, she says, I want you to invite all your friends at school that don't go to church. And we're going to have a big party here. But then I'm going to tell them about Jesus. And there's a contest winner, and the winner gets to go to an Oakland A's game. So I won. 
I don't know if I had a gripping vision for my friends being lost. It was a gripping vision. I wanted to go to an A's game. But I got eight friends to come. And the, the class was just packed. And I want to share just a simple story about Jesus. And uh, I'll never forget that. Never forget that. As I know of to this day, many, many years later, four out of those eight young men are still following Christ. Doesn't get any better than this, friends. Let's pray. God, I thank you for this church. From the moment I walked through these doors, you could sense the love and the compassion. God, just help us to grow in this, in this journey towards compassion. Just thank you for these four rope holders that show us what it takes to get people to Jesus. May we live with this gripping vision, selfless unity, irrational compassion, and this. And, and, and God, may we just look at our activities spiritually and just make sure that what our sacrifices are doing are useful. God, we pray this year that many would come through these doors and would feel safe to meet you, Jesus. For family members, for our foster system, for our refugee neighbors, for those around the world, for our own neighborhoods, God. May we just see this year more and more people come to know you. That's what we were set apart to do.